Our team of meteorologists have been up to something big. And although California is in the middle of a severe drought, climate change is increasing the risk of a catastrophic flood. And this summer, a report came out warning that a disastrous mega flood is coming to California. Our meteorologists have been interviewing the state's top researchers for months and asking, what is a mega flood? What damage could it do? And are we ready? So tonight, Rob Carl Mark kicks off our week-long series, and he's taking a look at the history of flooding in Sacramento and what could happen next. All of our tools were tough march on the water. It looks like a bomb went off there. Imagine the biggest storm you've ever been through. He had to chainsaw his way out his front door. Cold, hard rain has local creeks and rivers running high. All this came underneath the doors. What if the rain didn't stop? A levee breaks. Your neighborhood starts taking on water. In Sacramento region alone, there's over 514,000 people that are protected by these levees. Studies suggest that Sacramento is actually one of the top 10 in the nation most at risk for flooding due to rivers. The most intense atmospheric river storms are likely to become significantly more intense. And certainly this spillway incident was one of those instances where we did not have time. Are we prepared? This is Mega Flood. When it started raining in November, people sort of took notice. Eh, it's winter's coming early. And then right before Christmas, the storms really hit. For folks living in California in 1861, then 1862, this wasn't a bad dream. It was their nightmare, and their life and livelihood was washed away. And there proceeded to be continual rain for 43 to 45 days. The storm started with a heavy, cold snow, followed immediately by very warm rain that washed down all that snow. Sean Turner is a guide that takes visitors in Old Sacramento back to this time and place of the Great Flood. And to do this, you have to go down, way down to the underground, where the city was originally built. Because of that heavy amount of water and debris coming down out of the hillsides, that levee was no match. The American River breached the levee approximately where Business 80 is now. The water then came in and flowed behind the city. Sacramento was inundated and annihilated by the biggest flood they had ever recorded here. Now, as the story goes, life must go on. And in the middle of the Great Flood, we had to swear in a new governor. His name was Leland Stanford, and he lived right here in downtown Sacramento. He had to climb out of his second story into a rowboat to get to the Capitol to be sworn in. The water would remain here for the next three months, an unbroken stretch of water for more than 250 to 300 miles. We're standing next to the foundations for the Hastings Building, Benjamin Franklin Hastings and Company Building. This building has been lifted up, up to the current level. This was a 500 ton brick building. That was one of the hundreds of buildings that were lifted over a 13 year span to lift the central business district up out of the floodwaters. Since the great flood of California and the lifting of Sacramento, we haven't yet seen the water rise that high. But we know there will be another time. As chaotic as California weather can be, it's also consistent. And history tells us well before we could document it that these floods happen every 100 years or so. And more are coming. The confidence of catastrophe casting lies in our understanding of the main ingredient of these floods, atmospheric rivers, or ARs. An atmospheric river is literally a river in the sky. It's just a river of water vapor moved by the wind rather than a terrestrial river, which is liquid moved by gravity. Marty Ralph is an expert on atmospheric rivers and says calling these ribbons of moisture a river is not an exaggeration. In fact, it might be understating California's primary source of water. An average atmospheric river transports the equivalent of like 25 Mississippi rivers worth of water. It's vapor. When that hits shore or hits the mountains, it's forced upward and some of that can condense into cloud and rain and snow in vast quantities. 40 to 60% of California water comes from ARs. If you get less than you expect, you're in a drought. More, and you flood. Much of the research lately is focused on forecasting atmospheric rivers, especially the super high-end ones that can break the flood banks. The Great Flood was the blueprint for a mega flood scenario called the Arc Storm Project back in 2011, a collaboration of more than 100 scientists and officials. 
at the time, it was the best understanding of the worst case scenario. The report was sobering to say the least. A cycle of major atmospheric rivers would quote, overwhelm the state's flood protection system. It would also prompt evacuations for more than a million people and cause nearly a trillion dollars in damage. Three times the damage of a major California earthquake. In short, a flood of this magnitude is California's biggest threat. Also, just like that earthquake, we know it's coming, except the future with mega floods is likely to be worse. Dr. Daniel Swain is a climate scientist at UCLA and co-author of essentially ArcStorm 2.0. What does a mega flood look like in our warming climate? Well, he found that these storms are now twice as likely to happen in any given year right now. And in the future, we can expect two to four times more runoff and flooding potential than we have historically ever observed. They're warmer, and this ends up being a really critical aspect in the Sierra Nevada in particular, because not only are you seeing atmospheric rivers that bring more water overall, but more of that water is falling as liquid rain rather than frozen snow. The report has brought our history with mega floods back to the future, and understanding that California's other big one is coming, and we need to be ready. Wow, that's a lot to take in. It is, it is. <laughs> I do want to be clear, though, when is this event expected to happen, or do we know? Right, you know, I think that's sort of the, the glaring alarm bells go off when you see something like that, um, because everyone that we talk to is so confident that it is going to happen. But I would just rest assured a little bit, forecasting has come a long way. We would have weeks and months of this kind of pattern, knowing we were, are starting to get into the danger zone. But there's a couple things that they learned that really tip them off. Most of the mega floods in the past happened during an El Nino, uh, El Nino episode. And when they model it out in the future, that's what they're seeing. So that's one place to look. But you just got to take it month by month and see where we are. And just knowing that we are in line for something like this, that it could happen here, I think sets everybody apart, just having that knowledge. Mm, but we will have a warning. So that's good news. Yes. Um, anything about this study surprise you at all? Um, I think what surprised me is that if you ask, are we prepared? Are we ready for this? They will say in their own version, not yet. We need to get things done quickly. We need to get it done sooner rather than later. If we wait too long, that's just more time that's wasted. So I think that surprised me is that they feel like there was still a lot of work to be done. But the good news, and we visited some of these projects, the work is getting done and they're planning for the future. So the best minds in California know about this. They're on it. They're working toward it. Working it. They're building for this event. The question is, is when it actually happens, are we there yet? And then this is just the beginning of the series. We have the whole week mm -hmm. we're going to be covering mega floods. So tomorrow, Monica's, uh, her story's running. Right. The closest that we've come to a true catastrophe related to flooding recently was when the spillway of the Oroville Dam broke. So Monica's going to talk more about that event and how it sort of gives a bellwether about how things may play out in the future. All right, Rob. Thanks mm -hmm. so much. We Thank appreciate you. it. And our mega, mega flood series runs all this week right here on To The Point. So don't forget, for more information about what a flood could look like, be sure to visit us online at abc10.com slash to the point. COVID cases are climbing again just in time for the holidays. And if you're going to get boosted before seeing family, doctors say that now is the time. That's after the break. COVID cases are up again. California averaged more than 11,000 new cases this past week. And according to the LA Times COVID tracker, that's an almost 90% jump from two weeks ago. And Sacramento is seeing one of the largest spikes in the state. But people that we're hearing from aren't changing their holiday plans. Instead, they're getting their bivalent booster. I'm really not thinking about myself, it's more others. My mom is 85, so I really don't want to put her at risk of getting anything from me. I would feel super, super bad, I'm pretty much devastated. And at this point, it's too late to be fully protected before Christmas, but doctors are encouraging people to get their bivalent boosters. That's the shot that better protects against the Omicron COVID variant. And now younger kids can get their bivalent booster too. The CDC, FDA, and state health officials have approved its use for kids as young as six months old. Up until now, they've only been available for those that are five and older. And the need for holiday donations is higher than ever, but donations are down. There's still time to help, and we'll show you how you can after the break.
You're probably seeing a lot of toy drive donation boxes at businesses and organizations where you live. Tis the season for giving after all, but we've had a handful of local nonprofits reaching out to us saying that they're seeing donations down this year while demand is up. And they're worried that they won't be able to give toys to all the kids that are in need. Like a hot beggar shows us how we can all help. We have toys um, for all ages. Um, you can see the kids under five and the toddlers are very impressive and very well loved. We can certainly use more gifts for those seven through 12 and our teenagers, even a gift card. For Greater Sacramento Urban League, President and CEO Dwayne Crenshaw, this toy drive is personal. I remember when I was 11 and I remember the exact year because it was the one Christmas we had no gifts. My father lost his job that summer. We weren't recovered. We weren't have nothing on the Christmas tree. And there are a lot of families who are going through that with COVID, with layoffs, with obviously the inflation, the housing costs are through the roof. The Greater Sacramento Urban League is collecting Christmas gifts for their toy drive coming up on Saturday and worry they won't have enough for all age groups, especially the older kids. Well, last year we served about 200 families, primarily here in the Oak Park area, but we know there's a greater need this year where our headquarters are in Del Paso Heights. There's a lot of families who've been reaching out. So we hope to double the number of gifts so we can expand the reach. Through Wednesday, they're collecting donations at the Urban League's Oak Park and Del Paso Heights locations from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. People can also donate money online, which will be used to buy gifts. We're getting ready for our annual toy, bike, and food giveaway. Penny Mims, co-founder of the nonprofit Mims Corner, which serves Stockton, Lodi, and surrounding San Joaquin County communities, is hosting a toy giveaway this Saturday, but she's worried they won't have enough donations to meet the demand. We're in need for toys right now. Like, it is a mandatory... Um, community call out. Please donate toys ages 3 to 12. This is in part because her nonprofit got a smaller distribution of toys for the giveaway compared to previous years from Toys for Tots of San Joaquin County. That's another nonprofit seeing a drop in donations. I've noticed it's been a decrease, especially at the Walmart events that we do. So it's, it's been rough, but we're slowly getting by and making sure we can do, do as much as we can and try to deliver as much as we can. U.S. Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Jonathan Lozano coordinates Toys for Tots of San Joaquin County. He says the most noticeable drop in donations has been in kids' bicycles. Last year we had almost 300 bikes. I believe this year we have less than 100 bikes. They've been collecting donations since October 1st and will accept them through this Thursday. They usually have 300 and they have not even 100. Yeah, and you know, those stands outside the Walmart, they looked full, but keep in mind, you know, this is Toys for Tots. A lot of people know Toys for Tots. Yeah. It's all relative, right? So even though they are getting a lot of toys in, it they're fewer than last year's toys count, and it's really definitely affecting their ability to give as many uh, toys as they want to these families. Exactly, yeah. and we know that this time of the year, there's a really big need. So if we do want to help, how can we help these organizations? The Greater Sacramento Urban League is accepting toy donations through Wednesday. Again, they're looking for gifts for older kids now. They have plenty of gifts for those younger ones. Uh, they'll accept donations at their office during business hours, or you can donate money online. In terms of being a recipient, this toy giveaway on Saturday is registration only, and registration has closed at this point, uh, but you can still give. Now, the MIMS Corner Toy Giveaway in Stockton, it's on Saturday. It's first come, first serve. No registration required, but the kid receiving the gifts must be present at the pickup. It's at the Greater Christ Temple of Stockton starting at 10 a.m. That church is also where you can drop off donations or you can make a donation of money online. Uh, they are accepting gift donations through Thursday. And then Toys for Tots, San Joaquin County, they have donation box all throughout the county, right? Yeah, every, a bunch of different businesses. We have a list for you online. They're accepting donations through Thursday. Now, we should note a registration to receive gifts from Toys for Tots of San Joaquin County is closed. Uh, but we do have more information on how you can give to those three nonprofits on our website, abc10.com slash to the point, And look for the article entitled, Links Mentioned on To the Point with Alex Bell. Perfect. How easy is that? <laughs> you can all help. Just go to the website. All right. Thanks, Becca. We appreciate it. And more than 1 million people in our area don't know where their next meal is coming from. But you can still help. You can donate to ABC 10's Stand Against Hunger campaign through this Sunday, which is on December 18th. All you have to do, again, super simple. Just text the word hunger to 916-321-3310. We'll send you all the details that you need. And right now, I'm very happy to update that we are upwards of $230,000 
right now from all of your generous donations. That's more than two million meals paid, for, paid by your generosity. So I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who's helped out with this. All right, that storm this weekend was no joke. This is video from the Placer County Sheriff's Office driving through Tahoe City this morning. And then thousands of people in the Tahoe area are still, still without power. Liberty Utilities crews shared this photo that showed the conditions that they have been working in just to get the lights back on. So Chief Meteorologist Monica Woods joins us now. Monica, how much snow and rain did we actually get over the weekend? There's some of places we're talking record setting snow. This is up at Palisades Tahoe where they recorded the sixth largest 24 hour snowfall. 35 inches coming in Saturday into Sunday and our total since December 1st at 90 inches. Some of our other area uh, ski resorts measuring about 50 to 70 inches of snow. So impressive totals as we've headed through the month of December. Also, our rain totals equally impressive, about an inch and a half to almost two inches throughout much of the valley. And this is giving us some great water totals. Our storm system is now pushing off to the east. Had some late day showers for parts of Southern California, but now things are starting to clear out as that low starts to move its way over towards the uh, desert southwest. And now in terms of our lows, those are going to be getting quite cold for the next couple of mornings. We're down into the 30s as we head into early tomorrow morning. Even some 30s across the coast, 30s and 20s throughout the foothills and single digits and teens throughout the Sierra. The other component of tomorrow morning's forecast, fog. So we're going to have to slow down, take some extra time on the morning commute and getting the kids out to school. Increase following distance, use the low beams and watch out for dense fog advisories over the next several days. Highs only warming to about 50 degrees tomorrow afternoon. This is going to put us well below average. Normally we should be about 56 degrees. We were closer to that for today. Morning low started us off at 43. But again, the next several mornings, we're going to be in the 30s. So it's going to be a struggle to get back to about the mid 50s. Right now in the Gilmore backyard, we've got clear skies, temperatures holding in the 40s. We still have that reporting station down at Tahoe. Big travel period coming up here. We've got six days and counting until Hanukkah. And we are just 20 days away from the new year. We're going to be leaning a little bit warmer here in the forecast and likely drier with that big travel period. Here's a look at our 10 day forecast. And as you can see, highs will be staying in the 50s, but those overnight lows are in the 30s as we start off the winter season next Wednesday. Chance of showers returning to the forecast. A local theater is on a mission to share stories of underserved communities in our area. Mark S. Allen takes us inside the Uli Theater in Midtown for a preview of a Christmas show like you've never seen before. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. That's Mississippi Motel, one of two plays that make up a naughty Christmas night at the Uli Theater a venue that specializes in bringing often underrepresented voices to the stage. For director Elise Hodge, this is the mission. An amazing theater, not a bad seat in the house, and talk about this production where marginalized communities and voices that don't always get a shot. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm just so pleased that we get to have both Brandon and Brooklyn involved with us tonight because um, they're, they're being able to bring something to the forefront that we don't normally get to see. Brandon Leak, who you know is the 2020 America's Got Talent winner, makes his stage acting debut here. Let's talk about how great the stage is, how great performance spaces like this are. Without a space like this, uh, you know, a lot of artists would feel the need to have to run to places like San Francisco or Los Angeles when... The capital of California is Sacramento. Joanna Johnson is Native American and star of A Naughty Christmas, also acting as a technical director. And it's also allowing to hear voices of people of color who are writers and that uh, get to have their stories told and their perspectives heard. We got a lot of work to do. We do, for is, sure. Is this helping? It definitely is. This show, our show, is going to have two people of color in it. Uh, the other show that comes right after us is going to have several people of color in that as well. And... We just need to keep keep casting us, keep putting us in the shows, keep telling our stories, and we will be in the right realm for sure. Like Galveston, Familiars, we just haven't played. A Naughty Christmas Night runs from Thursday through Saturday at the Uli Theater, and tickets are just 18 bucks or 12 if you want to watch from your couch and stream it at home. All right, before we go, I want to challenge you to ask yourself, what are you doing for the community? Not just during the holidays, but just all the time, all year round. If you caught our story last week, uh, Ruth Flaherty and her daughter, they're small business owners. They saw our show and they decided to get in the community. They're trying to help unhoused people, 100 people. So I ask you, what are you doing for the community and how can you help? Have a great night.
Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916 321 3310.